What's up, my wampas? It's Dev, and today we are going to have a little bit of fun ranking all of these super controversial theme booster exclusive rares from Throne of Eldraine. Whatever are we going to do? There are cards that aren't available in regular booster packs. Well, I don't think any of them are great, so we're going to start with Grasping Giant and Demon of Loathing because I think that these are probably the two worst, and they're actually balanced in interesting ways. Grasping Giant only costs six mana. It's splashable because it only costs the one white. It's got Vigilance. So that's kind of neat, considering it also has a really high toughness. If they don't let it hit them and they block it with something, you get to exile it. But if they ever do remove Giant, the things that it exiled just spring back into play. So that kind of... That kind of sucks. If you ever get your giant removed, and you do have to wait for it to attack in the first place to get any real value out of it, and very likely your opponent's just going to take five and it's rather than exile any of their creatures, you know. It's just really slow, as a lot of these cards are. Like, all of these are really overcosted, like Demon of Loathing, for instance. I do like a little bit more, but it costs a whole mana more, you know. It's, it's not as splashable. It costs two black mana in that converted mana cost as well. And it has to wait to attack as well to get any actual value out of it. So it costs so much. You have to wait a turn, hope it doesn't get removed or anything. So I don't know, but I will say if it ever does get in, it's got the trample. So it's probably going to do combat damage to a player. And if they sacrifice a creature, even if they remove Demon of Loathing at some point, then you still get to, you know, they don't get their creatures back <laughs> like they do with giants. So I think Demon of Loathing is like a little bit better in, in these rankings here, but only only slightly. I think the trample really puts it over the top, but I hate that both of these are super overcosted. You have to wait for them to attack and all that, but I'm going to move on to Victory's Envoy and Underworld Sentinel, another two cards that I think are like somewhat comparable only because they have like the same casting cost, I guess. <laughs> they both cost five. I guess I think think I like Underworld Sentinel a little bit less, but it's really, it's kind of a tough call here, because both of these are abusable in certain decks, but still not like abusable enough to really be worth it. Like, uh, Underworld Sentinel kind of looks like a sideways Bishop of Rebirth that's going to be better in some situations, worse in others, because it can grab like bigger creatures than, than Bishop of Rebirth can out of your graveyard. So I kind of like that, but Bishop of Rebirth saw like zero play, and very often the effect is more immediate on Bishop of Rebirth, so you can game it a little harder Harder, you know, you can use creatures with ETB effects. Although I will say that you can use like an aristocrat strategy. You could use Underworld Sentinel to sort of reanimate stuff that you've sacrificed or just reanimate huge stuff like a Dracu Seth or whatever if you wanted to. But it's just so much to set up. Like one of the best saving graces of this card is that a four mana four five or five mana four five isn't like the worst rate, but it's not a great rate either. <laughs> you, know, you can't say that about Envoy. Victory's Envoy is a five mana three three. That's not a good rate whatsoever. But but in a tokens build, if you actually got multiple turns to work with this, then I could see getting some real value out of it. Sort of an anthem effect for all your creatures. And again, in a tokens build, you could probably get like four, five, six power out of this. The first, un the first upkeep that it's in play. And then, you know, any more than that is just gravy. Your creatures get huge over the course of the game if this isn't answered. So I kind of, I do like the value inherent on Envoy. So I like it a little bit more, especially in the decks that want it. But I mean, no decks want it. Well, you could just play like Tristani in the five mana slot. So it's just, neither of these cards are quite good enough and both of them have to wait a turn just like the other cards we've looked at both of them are designed in such a way that you have to wait a turn to get any value out of them in the first place and that's not good especially like you know envoy is probably the one that i like more out of these two but envoy can be taken out by like a lightning strike type of type effect which is just awful for your five drops so again i wouldn't worry about either one of these like hitting the stratosphere in terms of price you know <laughs> like even though victory's envoy looks like it slots into a deck that needs help it's just still not good enough so i'm not too worried about it so let me move on to iron scale hydra and tree tree shaker chimera here actually kind of really like Chimera, so I'll start with Ironscale Hydra. The only real, like, draw to this card to me is a 5-mana five 5-5, five five, but we've seen those at the common level before in Magic, and, like, they don't do anything outside of the limited environment, so... And this won't even be available in the limited environment, so... Eh, you know, this this Hydra-centric ability where it gets plus one, plus one counters equal to the damage done to it has never been amazing. I guess some people played, uh, what was it, like Protean Hydra here and there when it was available, but this ability has just never been amazing. <laughs> I'm not really sure how much mana the ability is worth 
in terms of design space, you know? So I'm just, again, like, in a world where you could be casting Nyssa for this mana cost, Iron Scale Hydra will not, like, break the ceiling in terms of, like, what you expect the prices on these rares to be in these theme boosters. So moving on to Tree Shaker Chimera, I actually kind of kind of like this. Like, this is where things take a turn into cards that I sort of like. <laughs> Seven mana is so much, especially for a creature with only five toughness. Like, this can get gang tackled and taken out and it's going to get gang tackled <laughs> right well like because all their creatures have to block it but when it does die which it almost certainly will and it'll take out like two or three creatures with it then um you draw three which is really sweet and this isn't a card where you have to like wait to attack to get the value out of it because if they remove it with you know something that doesn't exile it like if it dies to a removal spell like a murderous ride or something you draw three which is pretty good it's not worth seven mana but you still draw three and, you know, get a removal spell out of their hand. So that's not terrible, but I guess for similar to this mana cost, you'd be casting like an in-raise forerunners or something in this format. So again, I don't think this is going anywhere, but in terms of like dies effects, this is very powerful. So if you could somehow reanimate this or get it for a similarly low cost and then get this dies ability over and over, I could actually see that being problematic, but I also don't see that happening. So I'm just, I'm not too scared of the card, but this is kind of where we get into cards to, to be slightly scared of. That said, my next card is a card that, like, it's just cool. That's the only reason it gets any points on my list. It's cool, and that's Serpent of Yawning Depths. This is six mana for a 6-6 six, six that can't be blocked. I mean, that's, kind of, that's kind of what it says. And I think that this could be, like, really, really cool in Commander if you wanted to build the Octopus Kraken Leviathan Serpent deck. I mean, it's definitely something you could be doing, and this is a card that, like, just wins the game in that deck. So I think this is definitely a card that will be in some ways sought after, but it's still not going to, like, destroy the ceiling in terms of price or anything. This is just a very wonky, goofy commander card that will fit into, like, a very specific, not super popular commander deck. But if you wanted to make the deck in standard, I mean, there's Octo Prophet. Shark to Crab counts. Uh, Mesmerizing Benthid is a card. I guess Lockmere Serpent is probably the best serpent or the best creature of any of these types in standard right now. So I think it's a Leviathan action. No, it's a serpent. It's a serpent. But um, anyway, I mean, it could be either one and work for this card. So I think it's really, really cool. And I want to try to build like a Mimi standard deck around it. And again, I think it might actually be a cool commander piece, but I don't think that this is really <laughs> like worth stressing over. I don't think it's going to hit like 20 bucks or anything, but I guess we'll have to wait, wait and see about that because people really like like goofy cards and this, this is definitely that. I mean, I like it. It's like halfway through my list, so it must it must be at least worth taking note of. The fact that it's an enchantment might matter, but I really doubt it. I think this is mostly for like people that want to meme in Commander and even Standard because there's like 16 different creatures of this creature type and there might be more in Theros. So like I'm interested in putting a deck together for the channel, but like... It's not going to win. So <laughs> let's put it that way and move on to um, Terror of Mount Velis right here, which I actually think is really cool, but I don't think it's going to do anything in standard. Again, for seven mana, you could be playing like Dracoseth. That's a better card, probably. So, you know, <laughs> Terror of Mount Velis is seven mana for a 5 5 flying double strike. But the ETB trigger is the cool part about this. All your other creatures gain double strike until end of turn. That is super neat. And if you can, like, Bond of Revival this into play, which kind of goes for all the other stuff, too. Like, if you Bond of Revival, a Demon of Loathing into play, like, that could be pretty decent, too. But I think this is, like, easily the best thing to reanimate in this entire grouping of cards here. Seven mana is so much, but if you can Blood for Bones it, or probably better Bond of Revival it on a field where you've got two or three other creatures that are of, of reasonable size, this actually looks like kind of dangerous. It's also worth noting that on turn four, you can like Iron Crag Feet into this, and that might be really good, you know? So, but I don't know if it'd be much better than like a Torbran in a lot of situations. So, and it costs you two cards to do the combo. Torbran's only one card. So, I'm not really sure how much better it is than Torbran on turn four. But if you can Iron Crag feed into this, obviously that could be problematic, depending on like what your first three turns look like. So, I do think that this card has like a chance to do some stuff in standard and probably like more than most of the other cards on this list deserves to be tested in standard if no other format you know but it's definitely a really cool reanimation target it's a cool target for iron crack feet and i'm a little bit worried about it but i don't think that even if it's like 
it forms sort of the backbone or at least it's an important card in like a big red deck or a reanimation deck. I still don't think that it's going to hit like the $20 mark and be like a problematic thing we have to worry about and all that. I just not, I don't see it happening. So let's move on here to Sphinx Mindbreaker. You want an ETB trigger? This is it, kid. This is seven mana, five and two blue for a six, six Sphinx with flying him. And an ETBs, you glimpse the unthinkable. <laughs> That's nuts. <laughs> That's really, really cool. Again, you can reanimate in this, this into play and just glimpse your opponent and that's like super hot <laughs> mill for 10 is really cool i wish that you could hit yourself that would be really cool but it says you know each opponent so it's commander playable because you get an each in that clause but if you could hit yourself then you could you know get all the narc amoebas and creeping chills all in one shot and that would be really cool you could put like reanimatable stuff in your graveyard if you wanted to undergrowth what there's just all kinds of stuff you could do if you could hit yourself but alas it can only hit opponents but i'm not really that I'm not too worried about that. <laughs> you know, this is something you don't have to wait to attack to get value with, but it is still like in your mill deck if you can actually get to it and, and pay for it fairly, you know, not cheat it into play somehow, but actually pay seven mana for it. Then you still get this big flying beat stick that it, it serves as an alternate win condition or it can just sit there like a fat body in the air and just deny your opponent attacks and stuff. So that looks really, really cool. Um, and the ETB trigger is desirable enough that if you can just bounce this back to your hand or flicker it, you know, blink it somehow over and over, um, maybe sacrifice it, reanimate it again. There are ways to do that. There's just my, my mind is really going in a lot of different directions with stuff you can do with this card. There's multiple ways to cheat it into play, but is it better to cheat into play with like a Blood for Bones than an Agent of Treachery? I don't think so. So I'm not sure that this is really going to like destroy standard and be one of these $25 cards, you know, that we fear out of these, um, these theme boosters. I don't think that's going to happen, so I'm not saying that, like, we need to worry or panic or anything, that this card's going to, like, spring up in value, but I do think that mill players are a relatively strong, like, faction of the community, and anything that has Glimpse the Unthinkable text on it, even for seven mana, is probably going to move some copies, so I expect this card to probably be somewhat pricey, but not, like, bad, you know, like a five, six dollar card, or something like that, um, in the long run, but again, I don't think that it's going to be horribly inaccessible, and I don't think that it's it's going to reach like nexus of fate levels in standard or anything I mean, it's a laughable idea but i do think it is a really cool card and i want to try to do stuff with it in standard like a lot like a lot like we we all know that a mill deck is almost there so if we can get like blue black mill with um you know merfolk secret keeper wall of lost thoughts and blood for bones to actually like put this into play on turn four I, there's there's ways there's ways but again I, we probably shouldn't get as excited as I'm getting right now. So <laughs> let's just say that. But my number one card of all of these um, theme pack exclusive rares is Death Bellow Warcry, which is a bad card. This is actually like a fairly bad <laughs> magic card, but I don't care. I mean, eight mana is an awful lot. That's, you know, a mana off of Iron Crag Feet. So like five mana at the earliest in standard, even if there's good Minotaurs to search up, which there might be, as Theros said, you know, it's, it's mythology theme. Themed. So there's probably going to be a good, you know, a good Minotaur to search up. So, I mean, they might even reprint like Fanatic of Mogus. And if they do that, then, woof, you know, <laughs> the, the go get, you know, three or four Fanatic of Mogus all at one time um, is, is probably going to be at least like a fun deck to try. You know, turn five, Iron Crag Feet. Death Bell of Warcry, four Fanatic of Mogus, I win. You can try it. <laughs> I'm not sure that it's going to be the best deck in the world, but you can do that in modern even if they don't reprint Fanatic of Mogus, and I'm still pretty sure that's not the best magic deck. But it's at least like a fun meme to try to do. And in Commander, this could really shine, and that's why it's in number one. Is because I think that it's probably going to end up being, at the end of the day, the most sought-after Commander card out of all of these. Um, the Kraken, the, the, Le the Leviathan notwithstanding, but I do think this is probably going to be the the the, goof the goofiest, wonkiest, craziest, most out there um, card that fits into a bunch of commander decks. And I'm not saying that there's like a bunch of really amazing, you know, Minotaur commander decks, but you can go get a Fanatic of Mogus, I've already said that, but you can get a Kragma War Caller and um, suddenly just swing with everything and they all get like plus two, plus oh. That seems, that seems really good because you're going to get in a bunch of Minotaurs all at one time, so you want Warcaller to be one of them. But you can also get like Firesong and Sunspeaker and do some kooky stuff. You can get Boros Battleshaper 
And as long as you got, you know, Warcaller along with it, then you can swing, you know, and just wreck combat for that turn. And hell, you know, Boros Battleshaper, Battleshaper is almost worth the cost of Warcry in and of itself, and you get three other Minotaurs along with it. So, again, in Commander, I could see this being, like, really, really cool as a tutor that eventually, the, essentially puts a bunch of haste Minotaurs into play and wins the game. Like, I want to try it really bad, and that's why, again, I think that it's probably easily the, the, the highest level of all of the cards that we that we're seeing you know the, the 10 cards that we're getting exclusive to these theme boosters um but again I, I don't think that this is something to necessarily panic over or anything um in 10 years from now it might be 25 dollars, but i re i highly doubt it and this actually looks like the kind of thing that might see a reprint at some point like in a modern masters set of some kind so i know they're not te technically not doing those but they will do sets like them so you know i could a uh, horizon set of some kind i could see this getting a reprint in even like um a dual deck if they do a product line similar to that in, in any case i can see this getting some sort of reprint at some point i don't think it's going to be exclusive to this to this product line and this product line only for its entire existence but again that's speculation and even if it is specific to this product line and only this one forever i don't know that it's going to get to like the 20 dollars level we'll have to wait and see about that but it's definitely the most attractive of these cards for commander in my opinion which is usually a good measure for like long-standing um price so it's definitely my number one pick if only because i think it's going to be the most sought after of all of these cards even if it's not the most effective in terms of you know uh design or in terms of play or effect on the battlefield i think that's probably terror of mount velas <laughs> but just in terms of like the price ceiling i think these cards can get to i think war cry is probably the number one pick but that's all i got for today let me know how you felt about these rankings i'm pretty sure you will down there in the comments section like the video if you want to pre-order any of this stuff go over to tcg player you can do that i'll leave a link in the description to their pre-orders you can get singles you can get you know um uh, sealed boxes and whatnot for well below what in MSRP would be if MSRP still existed. Thanks, Wizards, but still. You can get boxes for a below $100 on pre-order right now, which is always a good deal. So hit the link in the description. Subscribe to the channel for more spoilers and deck techs and stuff. I got one coming out tomorrow, a deck, that I'm really excited about. So in any case, I think that that's it for today. Again, just let me know how you felt about them, and I'll catch y'all later. I'm Dev from The Place. Thanks for watching, my Wizards. Spread love and be kind.